Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Jason Morrison. I am the president of the Pacific Institute and I serve as the head of the UN Global Compact's Sea Water Mandate. It is a partnership between the Pacific Institute and the UN Global Compact that focuses on corporate water stewardship. Uh, it began in 2007 uh, and is uh, going strong and growing uh, to this day. Thanks for taking the time to be with us today. We're gonna to talk today about uh, work that's taken place over the last few years around uh, contextual water target setting. And uh, today is going to be an opportunity to share some of the lessons learned that have come out of pilot tests uh, that um, uh, applying this framework. But I'm gonna say a few minutes, uh, spend a few minutes, sorry, at the outset, uh, trying to tee up this issue uh, and then I'll walk through the agenda and then I'll hand to my colleagues and panelists to, to run through the uh, content. So unlike carbon and climate, uh, it's hard for a company to just set a global ambition and reduce greenhouse gas emissions in one part of the world and have that realize benefits globally. Water, as we know, is very contextually dependent and thus, companies need to figure out how they can set an enterprise level ambition for water, but then also apply that ambition and tailor that ambition in ways that are contextually relevant. Uh, and that is uh, that need, whether it's motivated from a company that's trying to orient around water risk reduction, or as we move from historically the, the corporate uh, 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 CSR orientation of do no harm to the 2020s where we are now thinking about how do companies become part of the solution. Whatever the motivation, what that requires is for companies to be able to have tools and frameworks that allow them to understand what are the most important challenges in that area and how can the company set its strategies and its ambitions in a way that address those issues. Hence the emergence of contextual water target setting. So uh, the way this is going to work, uh, we're going to do a quick survey uh, at, just to understand where folks are from when uh, taking into this, uh, calling into this webinar. Then my colleague Tian is going to do a overview of this framework uh, that the Sea Water Mandate uh, produced in collaboration with a number of organizations: the Nature Conservancies, WWF. World Resources Institute, CDP, and UNEP DHI, so a consortium of project partners developing this framework. Uh, and then we're gonna jump right into a summary of a couple of recent uh, applications of this framework, one in Southern India and the other in South Africa. And then we're gonna pivot to a panel discussion uh, of uh, some of the protagonists, the member companies that have been involved in this piloting exercise and see if we can extract some of the key insights from that uh, experimental work uh, that uh, has uh, just been completed and published. Time allowing, we'll have some uh, Q&A for the panelists uh, and then we'll wrap up with a little bit more information uh, uh, pointing you to where you can find a little bit more information uh, on this work and how you can apply it in your own organization. So with that, let's get the survey up. Oh yeah, sorry, the, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, there are two input functions uh, for attendees. Uh, one that we ex uh, would ask you to utilize is the Q&A function. And if you, throughout the course of this uh, in, entire webinar, have questions you would like us to respond to what we will be doing uh, over the course of the hour is synthesizing and collating that so that we can feed it into the panelists. Um, and we will, uh, I, to the degree to which there are questions that are uh, like questions, we'll try to bundle them, um, but otherwise we'll take them in sequence that they came in. Uh, and we will also be recording this and we'll also uh, send out uh, the slides because uh, that's often one of the questions we get are, can we see the deck that's been presented? So with that uh, housekeeping, let's get to the uh, first polling question. Uh, and it should be fairly straightforward. We're just trying to get an understanding of uh, where uh, folks are tying into this webinar from. So if you just move your cursor over and uh, click one of those regions, uh, this will... Um, 
compile the results. Uh, and while you're taking the time to do this, uh, I will, uh, Tian, just uh, verbally hand over to you. Maybe you can be the one that uh, responds to the outcomes of the survey and then take it straight from there with the overview of uh, the site water target setting. Great. Okay, it looks like most of, most of the participants are calling in from North America and there's quite a few from Europe and Africa and some in Asia and South America and 1% in Australia. So a good mix globally, welcome. Great, uh, thanks, thank you Jason for the introduction. So I'll give an overview of the framework, the contextual water framework, and some background on why this is important. So this is a figure from the CDP 2018 water security survey where over a half of the companies found that they faced water risks and potential financial impacts from those risks. So these are the top five water risk, including stress, flooding, droughts, and declining water quality and potential financial impacts includes reduction in production capacity, increased operating costs, constraints, and growth. Next slide, please. So in response, more and more companies are moving from internal efficiency targets to targets that incorporate catchment context. And these are two buckets that we're grouping targets in, including contextual water targets, which is focused on the right things, or the priority water challenges in the right place where basins are facing high water risk. And most of the guides and methods and pilot tests have been developed within this bucket. There's also the science-based targets for water focused on quality and quantity in the right place also in high-risk basins and at the right levels. So factor in, in the thresholds of the basin or the basin desired end state, including the hydrological science and an allocation of responsibility. Next slide. More companies are setting meaningful water targets. Um, Cargill and Levi's are two seal water mandate companies that have recently set contextual water targets. Uh, Cargill looked at targets for the operations and agricultural supply chain, and they looked at water availability, water quality, and access to drinking water and sanitation. They looked at the various thresholds for, for those three priority challenges in order to prioritize where they worked and also set the magnitude of that target based on those thresholds. Levi's, and you'll hear more from Brian later, um, has an overall goal to reduce water use and manufacturing by 50% in areas of high water stress. And depending on where the manufacturers were located, they, had, uh, they will have different efficiency and water use targets based on the water stress that they face. Next slide, please. So water targets incorporating catchment context leads to several outcomes, reducing risks at the catchment level, realizing new opportunities by working collaboratively with other stakeholders and contributing to water security and sustainability. Next slide. These are the three elements for setting water targets. The first is water targets should be respond to priority water challenges within the catchment. The ambition of the water target should be informed by the sites and to water challenges and desired conditions. And water targets should capitalize on opportunities and contribute to public policy priorities. These approaches will differ slightly based on the geographic location and the company, whether they're in a different industry sector or their maturity progression. So you'll hear more about how these three steps have been piloted in different regions of the world. Next slide. These are the leading companies that have participated in the pilots. 
um, the three ones in the Santa Ana and the Nora Bobani in Southern India and then three basins in South Africa. The Water Resilience Coalition to your bottom right is also using the contextual waters, water targets framework to understand the key water challenges and also identify actions that produce meaningful impact at the basin level. Next slide. So if you're interested in to learning more, here are the guides and the pilot tests and the website. And I'll hand it off to Sonali and Hannah to discuss the lessons learned from India and South Africa. Thanks, Tian. I'll take over. Um, thanks, Hannah. Um, so I wanted to start by sort of setting the stage. We conducted three pilot test cases around the world to um, test out this framework on setting contextual water targets. This was in Santa Ana in California, the Noya Bhavani in South India, and the Berg Breed and Vala Basins in um, South Africa. So contextual targets can be set in a multitude of ways. Um, however, and often it's done with a single site. However, our pilots were conducted as clustered pilots, which is special in the sense that we worked with multiple companies, all with operations in a single watershed. This meant that participating companies um, were able to foster a collective understanding of water challenges, as well as potential solutions. It also, we found, led to a strong desire for collective action to address water challenges. We've compiled some of the learnings across all the pilots here to hopefully provide some insight into the process. I'm not going to go through this entire list, but I encourage everyone to um, look up our case studies and go through them. They're in all three. Um, some of the big ones that we, uh, that we saw across all the pilots. First off, every region is unique, not only in its water-related challenges, um, but also political structures, cultural customs, and historical context. If you're not based in the region, like we were in for the South um, India pilot, local partners can provide really good on-the-ground perspective and necessary guidance. It will also ensure that you're not duplicating existing efforts, but are instead complementing them. Um, secondly, good quality local data and effective stakeholder engagement are essential to uh, both assess the catchment and create actionable targets. Engaging stakeholders throughout the process will help um, understand the region in a way that policy and data can't. Um, I also want to note that while good data can really make your life much easier, it's important um, to note that the lack of good data should not deter actions. It can often mean that it leads to an alternative process like robust stakeholder engagement to augment understanding. Um, the next one I'll pull out is that site targets come in many shapes and forms. What I mean by this is that it can be specific, it can be process related, it can be quantitative, qualitative. And while quantitative measurable targets are ideal, other kinds of target can, targets can definitely lead um, to meaningful action. Um, often targets that mitigate both shared water risks for stakeholders across the catchment and take company strategies into account are likely to be very far reaching and effective. Um, also, just a quick plug for collective action. We found that often setting site targets is resource intensive. However, working with other sites to collect data and learn about opportunities reduces the resource burden on each company. Implementing these targets collectively will create scaled impact since multiple users will have a greater overall footprint within the catchment. Next slide, please. Um, so um, I'm going to jump into the Nayal Bhavani uh, test case before handing over to Hannah. So in India, the pilot was focused on the Nayal and Bhavani sub-basins of the Kalbari, a region well known as a global textile export hub responsible for 90% of knitwear exports from India. So these spatial boundaries were chosen well, primarily because of hydrological boundaries, but also part, it was where participating companies had um, significant operations. We carried out this clustered pilot with Levi's, Gap, and PVH. And we also partnered with ATRI, a research NGO based out of South India, as well as the Sustainable Apparel Coalition and Anthesis. Early on in the process, um, we recognize that water is and always has been um, an intrinsic part of the textile manufacturing process. The participating companies had already done a significant amount of work on site to address water issues and were particularly interested in um, working collectively on water stewardship beyond facility fence lines to foster impactful work. 
And we took that into consideration throughout the process. Um, next slide, please. Um, so the first step in this was to do a catchment diagnostic and stoplight analysis, which we did in collaboration with ATRI, using metrics that informed the current and desired condition of each of the six water challenges. And we've shown just a little snippet of the diagnostic here. We assessed the current condition and the desired end condition of the basin, and that gap was then used to prioritize water challenges. Um, this was done using data from primary and secondary data sets, scientific literature, key um, interviews, as well as group discussions. We also found that often the lack of data itself was an interesting finding, and we included metrics that we felt were important but lacked data. For example, um, some of the ecosystem metrics speak to this. Um, next slide, please. So like I mentioned, um, stakeholder engagement is a really crucial part of this process. We um, ground truthed all our findings with an in-person workshop in Coimbatore that facility managers, NGOs, and brand representatives attended. The workshop helped uh, reconfirm our findings and we found that our priority challenges resonated with stakeholders. We also saw um, a strong reaffirmed commitment to collective action and a desire for companies to work together to make change. It's also just a great opportunity to get all sorts of different people in the same room and see all the brains um, working really well together. Next slide, please. So um, the next step focused around setting targets. The direction and ambition of targets can be informed by assessing firstly the gap between the current and desired end state that I already mentioned. Secondly, the facility's impact on those challenges. Third, the company's capacity and ambition to help close that gap. And fourth, the water stewardship opportunities in the basin. We also ensured all targets are SMART. As you can see on the slide, this stands for specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound. Um, and for our pilot, our target spoke directly to the desire we heard from companies for collective action. Next slide, please. Uh, this is, so for the project, we developed a database of water stewardship projects within the basin and a list of possible targets related to each water challenge, along with metrics to track and measure progress. This is just one of the challenges. Um, so to tailor these targets to facility needs, we also sent out a survey to gauge whether these uh, targets resonate with facilities and narrow down our list based on this feedback. Companies and their facilities can pick and choose what works best for them from this list, knowing that it is based on a strong scientific understanding and has been ground truthed with stakeholders. Overall, the process cultivated a collective understanding and agreement around targets and actions that can address challenges in the basin and are aligned with facility ambition. In this pilot, part of the next phase will be to make connections among facilities in the basin with similar ambitions and targets and to ultimately um, implement a collective action project. I'll stop there and hand over to Hannah. Great, thanks, Sonali. So I was um, involved in the case study for South Africa. And as you can see on the map for the South African case study, we were involved in the Upper Vaal as well as the um, Berg Olifants and Breda Choritz catchments, which is around Cape Town and the Upper Vaal is around Johannesburg. And these are just a couple of pictures for those of you who are not um, familiar with South Africa. The Tiavata's Kloof Dam is one of the main supply dams for Cape Town, which was running dry um, in the most recent drought. And then the Val Dam is also a major component in the infrastructure uh, supplying water to the Gauteng Johannesburg Regional Hub. In our case study, we were quite lucky because uh, recently WWF have done a downscaled water risk filter for South Africa. And so from a data perspective, many of the water challenges that we're interested in were quite nicely mapped spatially um, on the online tool. This also helped with evaluating what the desired condition for the catchment could be because um, 
naturally a low risk or a green shaded area for simplicity's sake is better than red. And so this just helped us to evaluate what some of the main water challenges are across the, the sub-basin. And so for each different indicator that we're interested in, like what Sonali presented earlier, we could uh, download different spatial maps to show the different risks. What we also did um, across the case studies in South Africa, and this is particularly for the Vaal Basin case study, is once we'd gone through the process of evaluating the challenges and figuring out what some of the main um, targets should be, we put together a long list of all the different types of targets. And then because this is not informed purely and only by science and by the water challenge, but also a few other uh, values and factors of importance for the company. So for instance, um, we had a score on whether or not a project was low cost or not. So it was the value for the investment that you're going to make. The other um, indicator which helped us prioritize the projects was whether or not the specific project had a high catchment impact. So for some projects, um, the impact on the catchment is not as large as, for instance, the impact on the site. And so we um, added those two scores as a way to help evaluate which projects were preferable than other projects. And then ultimately, because Working outside of your factory fence and within collective action has risks. We also had a score on what the level of risk was for that project, specifically in a country like South Africa, where working with the public sector has certain um, challenges associated with it, as well as working with impoverished communities, there are always um, risks associated with collective action. And as much as there are opportunities, we felt it was important to also evaluate projects off the back of those risks. So you can see what the main um, project that we selected was in terms of a, a target setting approach and uh, Ravash from uh, Sasol will probably speak about this a little bit later in the um, panel discussion so I won't steal his thunder. Another um, process that we went through to help companies prioritize what their target should be was a benchmarking exercise. So this example was with the Hilton Hotel specifically. And off the back of the image I showed you earlier of the major water challenges in Cape Town from a supply perspective, this was one of the main um, targets that the hotel wanted to focus on, which was reducing consumption. But it was useful to try and evaluate how much wriggle room there was in terms of reducing consumption. So we found data of what the best practice is for a comparable climate globally, so other Mediterranean type climates, and then also um, we're in conversations with the hotel and tourism sector in Cape Town about what the best practice is for hotels in Cape Town. And then this gave us an indication of where the opportunity lies for the Hilton Hotel Group in terms of um, water saving for their hotel in the, in the country. So this was just a useful way to uh, streamline the targeting process and land the companies in what they really wanted to focus on in terms of mitigating their water challenges. So just to come back to some of the lessons learned um, that Sonali touched upon earlier and the ones that were specifically uh, related for South Africa is that most water challenges are interconnected. That's the one I'd like to highlight. Um, so for example, in the Val River system, some of the failures of the governance of the water system in the integrated Val um, system is leading to water supply challenges. But ultimately, at a climatic lens, there is enough water. It's about the management of the infrastructure. And so in that case, the water challenges are interconnected between governance and climate and water supply, for example. Um, and then something really important which uh, Sonali has already highlighted is the role of collective action and that um, part of the risk score with some of the projects or some of the targets that were evaluated was associated with whether or not a company could do this alone or not. And we know that water challenges are 
interconnected and really complex and it's difficult for a single company to go it alone. So without further ado, I think um, we'll hand over to the second poll um, before we quickly, well, before we dive into what I think is the most important part of this presentation, which is the uh, panel discussion. So the question is, in your opinion, is the top challenge facing companies that are setting water targets? Right, so these I think are going to be quite interesting results. It looks like um, the top challenge is working with partners, government and other companies. Um, yes, so collective action is hard. Uh, other top challenge is understanding the company's contribution to basin resilience. And um, this is also a, a major uh, talking point that we had during the, the pilots. Um, so thanks for all of those uh, inputs. And um, without further ado, I'll hand over to Tien, who will moderate our panel discussion. Great, thank you, Hannah. And so for the next 20 minutes, we'll have Byron Thayer, Megan Farrell, Ravash Pandey, and Varas Kaur talk, um, go through and have a panel discussion. And so before we start off, I just wanted to remind everyone that for uh, to include the questions in the Q&A box um, on the bottom right hand side of your um, your screen and not through the chat through all panelists. Thank you so much. So um, I'll hand it off to the panelists to give themselves a, a introduction. Great. I'll start off. Uh, my name is Byron Thayer. I manage our corporate water strategy at Levi Strauss and Company. Um, and I've been with the company for uh, about seven years. I'll go next. Uh, my name is Megan Farrell, and I am a Director of Environmental Sustainability at PBH. For those of you who don't know, PBH is a parent company um, to brands such as Calvin Klein, Tommy Hilfiger, and Van Heusen, and many more brands. Um, and in my role, I'm responsible for PBH's climate, water, and waste strategies and strategic programs. Yeah, my name is Ravash Pandey. I'm the Senior Specialist Sustainable Water for SASL responsible for driving SASL's water stewardship program. Uh, for those of you who don't know much about SASL, we're an integrated uh, chemicals and energy company uh, headquartered in South Africa, but we have operations in Africa, Europe, uh, Middle East, Asia, and America. And we've been a mandating endorsing company for some years now and utilizing the mandates water stewardship framework in terms of uh, responding to our water risks. Thank you. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Firoz Kur. I'm the Group Head of Sustainability for Woolworths Holdings Limited. We are a retail business based in um, Cape Town, South Africa, and we have operations in South Africa, um, 10 other countries in Africa, as well as in Australia and New Zealand. Great, thank you. And so the first question, and this is to all panelists, and you can also go in order, their name listed on the slide is, for your company, how does setting targets based on local context add value or fill a gap within your company's sustainability practices? Okay, so I'm first on the list. So uh, I say the contextual approach adds value to us in, in two key ways. Um, one about science, another about business resiliency. Um, so first, on the science side, you know, this approach allows us to take a more science-based approach to addressing local watershed needs. And so our water action strategy uses the latest 
uh, water stress data sets from WRI to develop manufacturing facility level targets that are commensurate with the local context where they operate. Um, and so, for example, we are committed to reducing our water use in manufacturing in those high stress water geographies by 50% by 2025. And that's an absolute reduction, not a per product reduction. And that is simply because the science indicates that that is the level of ambition that is required in those geographies. Um, and then second to the second broad point is that, you know, taking such a data driven and outcome oriented approach um, means that we can really put the resiliency of, the, of our supply chain in the forefront because we're treating water like the business critical input that it is. You know, after all, our own life cycle assessment showed us that a single pair of Levi's 501 jeans requires about 3,800 liters of water you know, across its life cycle. A lot of that water is used in those high water stress geographies. Um, and, so that, and so that is very relevant to the, to the resilience of our own supply chain. Um, and I'll put in a little plug for the Water Resiliency Coalition. That, of course, is another reason why we're proud members of that organization, because it elevates that to uh, the forefront as well. And I'll just chime in here, you know, very much uh, agreeing with a lot of the things that Byron said. So just some background on PBH and our, our actions related to water. So. We prioritize efforts to improve water quality and quantity in key sourcing countries with water stress, and the company has a specific public commitment to establish five collective action projects at the basin level by 2025. And I'll also put, put in a plug here, not only for the CEO water mandate that we've been signatories of, but we're also a proud founding company of the Water Resiliency Coalition, which was launched earlier this year. So specifically when it comes to setting targets that are based on local context, you know, it's really imperative for us to not only provide, or it's imperative for us to not only provide value, but also to ensure the relevancy of the targets. So challenges related to water are not static, nor can be solved by a one size fits all solution. And so it's critical to fully understand what the unique basin specific challenges are before understanding how best to address them. Additionally, for us as an apparel company, you know, we need to be able to set targets that are not only relevant to the basin context, but also that are relatable to those and can be actioned on by our textile suppliers at the basin, which are key stakeholders for us. I'll also just lastly note that PVH has already established four collective action projects um, at key sourcing basins of water stress, so Ethiopia, China, Vietnam, and India. And a key learning for us in establishing these has been the importance of not only building consensus on the ground, but letting the science dictate the interventions necessary to improve the basin health. Yeah, so, so from a Cecil perspective, setting water targets are, are more from a risk-based uh, approach. Uh, water is a, is, a, is a critical feedstock to our operations and we require it at a uh, high assurance of supply. And uh, in terms of our risks, 80% of Cecil's total global demand for water is at our South African operations. And uh, of that, all that water comes from a water, the water stressed integrated VAR of a system, which Hannah described. And Cecil's the largest private sector user from the system with three, about 4% of demand from the system. And the integrated water system faces a number of challenges from, um, you know, from a supply quality and as Hannah said, from a governance perspective. And, you know, looking at it from a risk-based approach perspective, we, we basically believe that setting aspirational context-based water targets uh, by driving on-site activity as well as looking at beyond the fence line, we, we believe that, you know, trying to reduce losses beyond our fence line is, is a more meaningful way and a way to drive collective action in terms of reducing demand for the system. Yeah, so, so that's the approach we've been taking from a target setting perspective. Faraz, you might be on mute.
can you hear me now, Tian? Yeah. Sorry about that, uh, a mic issue. So from our perspective, being a, a retailer with both a food business as well as an apparel business, we have the dual challenges of securing water from two very different types of supply chains. So our food business is primarily South Africa based, both in the, in, uh, the, the retail side of it, as well as in the sourcing. So we source um, over 90% of our food locally in the South and Southern Africa uh, region and much of it in, in water stressed areas. And so that's where we started our, our context based work and our, our uh, basin level work around some of the, um, it, 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 it did follow a bit of a risk based approach as well, looking at some of our key commodities and understanding the water uh, context in those areas. But it, looking at it beyond just the food business, um, our, our apparel business uh, has a huge supply chain um, where we source a product globally and being a small player in that requires participation in collective action initiatives. So uh, that's where our engagement, for example, with the uh, Water Resilient um, Coalition comes in, is that we are a small player in, in, in global supply chains, but we realize the importance of uh, the impact, our biggest impact for water sits in our supply chain rather than direct operations. And if, if we want to be making any significant uh, contribution to, um, to, to, to water, we need to be doing it in our supply chain rather than in, 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 at a retail level. And so for us, the working uh, collective action is the only way for us to drive uh, significant change. And so for, uh, uh, target setting within that context, for me, drives focus on a, an end goal um, it, 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 it forces the business to, to, to prioritize where it wants to make interventions, but it also uh, ensures that the business understands that achieving uh, a significant change is not only in, in, its, uh, in its power, it, it, it requires working with others, whether they are the corporates, whether they're NGOs, government, suppliers, and so on. Great, thank you. That was very useful. and. Um, now I have a, one question I'll ask to Byron more about your recent contextual water targets and how did you get the corporate or internal buy-in? Yeah, um, it was a long process. <laughs> um, but my starting point when I was talking to the company leadership was, was really just a simple observation, which was that you know, saving a liter of water in a dry location is more impactful than saving that same liter of water in a wet location. And the implication of that, of course, is that we as a company should focus our energy on those geographies where there's the highest water stress rather than a one size fits all approach to all geographies where we operate. Um, and our leaders, they immediately understood this. It's very intuitive to them. They said it was a common sense approach to a complex issue. You know, the idea is kind of simple on the front end and nuanced on the back end, which is exactly the way C-suite people like things anyway. Um, but I was also very upfront with them that this approach would de-emphasize such large numbers of, you know, total liters of water saved globally, which is uh, something that we had done previously, lots of other companies do it also. Um, but what we gain is that our numbers now, they more accurately reflect the on the ground impact that we're having, as well as the on the ground risk reduction that we're having to our own supply chain. And I see this as, you know, it sets us apart in the industry. It refocuses attention where it belongs which is the local context. Um, and it provides for some local storytelling opportunities as well. Great, thank you so much, Byron. And to you, Megan, I'm looking more externally. What challenges do you anticipate driving action at the local level around the connection? Yeah, so uh, no, uh, thanks for that, um, Tian. So rather than maybe stating the challenges, I'll reframe my response in terms of things that I think are really critical to get right. And many of these things were already highlighted by Sonali and Hannah earlier, but I do think it's worth kind of reiterating them. So 
Firstly, I would say that building trust and credibility with your stakeholders on the ground is absolutely imperative. This includes governments and any implementing partners that you have on the ground, which was uh, funnily enough noted as one of the biggest challenges in the previous polling question. So it was kind of nice to see that connection. Um, closely linked to that trust is also creating a shared ownership of attainment of the targets you set with your stakeholders. So really thinking through how best to incentivize action is going to be important. Um, providing the support needed to make progress against your targets is incredibly important and really where the rubber meets the road. So where are you seeing low hanging fruit and quick wins that drive progress against the targets and making sure that those are then shared as best practices and cascaded and, and I think that's really critical. And then lastly, ensuring that your means of collecting data is credible and complete so that you're actually measuring progress accurately. And then this is obviously a, a challenge across the board, I think, in, in the field of sustainability. Um, I just want to call attention to the realities, though, of the pandemic and the fact that the way in which we work has and will continue to evolve. And specifically related to COVID, it is it has greatly impacted how we engage and communicate with our teams and stakeholders, both internally as a company, but also externally with our stakeholders on the ground at the basin level. So I think it's just important to note that in light of this, I know as PVH, we are continually monitoring our work, pivoting as opportunities arise and tailoring our communications so that we can continue to drive progress on the ground. Excellent, thank you, Megan, for those lessons and also the realities of today. Uh, the next question is to Ravash and wanted to touch on the targets that you landed on through the prioritization process and what you thought the most optima optimal way forward to increase water security for Sassel and your stakeholders were in the catchment and also bring in that perspective of the reality we're in today. Yeah, so, you know, the in, t in terms of the, the proposed targets, uh, I think you know the the outcomes of the pilot was quite clear that uh, more meaningful savings could be achieved beyond fence line than on site. So, following a dual approach by by setting on site targets, but as well as looking at um, at working with host municipalities in terms of reducing losses. So, I, I just want to touch on some of the challenges that we face in the integrated bar river system and why the outcomes of the pilot was quite meaningful in terms of proposing targets to the business. And, uh, you know, as Hannah initially alluded to, is that uh, the integrated water of a system is water stressed where demand is outstripping supply. And, and a lot, some of these challenges are governance related where the inability to maintain and uh, uh, maintain and, and operate supply infrastructure that places supply to our operations at risk. And, but however, the most, uh, the most, the lowest hanging of fruit in terms of opportunities is, is reducing municipal losses. We have a water board called RAN Water that supplies 18 municipal customers. And in the integrated water of a system, we have losses of in excess of 37%. And we, we found that, you know, by supporting ran water and then municipal customers in terms of reducing those losses will, will be quite meaningful in terms of protecting the system. And therefore, in terms of proposing targets to the business, we, we landed on, on, a, on a quantity target to reduce river water demand, either setting it on site or looking for opportunities beyond the fence line, partnering with host municipalities and, and, and basically uh, setting meaningful context-based water targets. Um, and then through the mandate, we try to drive collective action in the sense that, you know, being a large water user, we have a very good understanding of what the system, uh, the risks within the system. And therefore we, we, try, we, we try to educate as many businesses who would be impacted in the, in the, in the case of water restrictions being imposed and, and therefore trying to get collective action to support this, uh, re this project 1600, which, which ran water is driving in terms of reducing municipal water losses. So yeah, as much as we, we would like to land these water targets, we believe that 
only meaningful impact can be done through collective action. Thanks, uh, Jian. Thank you, Ash. That's excellent. And then I'll turn to Faraz. Um, you've recently launched a set of a suite of sustainability targets, and I'm wondering how water fits into your other sustainability targets. Yeah, so we've been working on a, a set of targets which we're actually going to be presenting to our board next week, Tuesday, um, um, around a, a forward-looking set of targets to take us, uh, our program and the business um, for the next 5, 10, 15 years um, on, on key sustainability issues. And we, within that, we, we did significant work on benchmarking and, and looking at what best practice is, what the impacts on the business are, where there's both risks and opportunities and so on. And, and, and through that process, we've landed on a comprehensive set of targets, in climate change, uh, carbon reduction targets, we've set a science-based uh, target for uh, CO2. Um, uh, we're uh, looking at targets on um, furthering our renewable energy, on, on sourcing of uh, renewables, on uh, energy productivity, a variety of, of, of areas. Um, and, and one of them is um, on water itself. And what we felt is in the water space, that in as much as we're driving, uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, given the nature of our business, being, being a, a retailer with, with significant number of suppliers, the biggest impact would be in, in our supply chain, um, that in fact, we're going to be adopting at, at a corporate level, the Water Resilience Coalition's target that we've signed up to as a corporate target out to 2050, and use that as a as a, as a basis under which we will then set rolling five-year targets towards achieving the, uh, the, uh, the bigger goal. We feel that have setting a target which talks to collective action and, and collaboration within a broader value chain, not just supply chain, but a value chain including other partners like our NGO partners, municipalities, uh, government departments, and so on, is the only way to, to make a significant difference in the, in the water space. It would be, it's, it's, it's quite a significant uh, time frame, a, a time horizon on the target. But the only way to make change in, in that space is to have uh, to be to be bold and to be looking long term. But at the same time, it needs to be supplemented then with workable uh, plans. And we think a five year rolling internal targets will assist us to to achieve that. So we're quite excited. Um, that's our proposal. We, it only goes to the board in in, in, in under a week's time. Uh, we, we we feel that it would be it's going to be well received there. And once we, we get over that uh, that internal hurdle, um, we'll we'll start our work on actually developing our our program to, to how do we see us getting to the 2050 um, end goal of the, of the coalition. Great, thank you for that Faraz. So those are great interventions. I'll hand it over to Jason for the Q&A. And so audience members, if, you're, if you have any questions to the panelists, um, to the presenters previously, please write it into the Q&A chat box. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Tian, and thanks to our panelists uh, for uh, leading the charge uh, in this uh, innovative space. So we've already got a, a number of very good questions, and I, I'm going to try to focus on two general buckets of, of questions that have come in. Um, uh, and it, we don't have enough time for every panelist to answer each of these questions. So I would just encourage you, if you have any insights that you, you feel speak directly to this issue that you step in, um, but we don't have to do uh, across the panel on this. So the theme that came through was, this sounds like a very powerful framework. Um, doing the basin diagnostic makes sense. Using that diagnostic to then set targets that speak to the priority water challenges makes sense then what? Then, then how do you prioritize action? What are some of the factors that allow you to prioritize action? So that's one bucket of questions that we got. How can you speak to how you then decided to move forward with action? And a sister question to that was, were, were the places where this was done as a cluster, are you setting joint targets and are those joint collective action efforts or were companies then moving forward unilaterally and if it was a combination of those two can you please explain how that worked who would like to get us started with either of those questions so 
So maybe I can step in just to talk about um, practically. I think it helps in the, I think being a, a food retailer and having a short food supply chain, specifically um, on key commodities, which we source in areas which are within a, uh, an hour or two's drive from our, from our, from our head office, allows you to, to get a sense of the reality of the, of this, of the issue. And so I think we, 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 we have that advantage and that's why we, we've made better progress with our food business than we have, for example, with our apparel business, which has significantly longer supply chains where we're sourcing in, in much more distant locations, um, you know, halfway around the world. So I do think having an appreciation with the, the key people in the business who are involved in the areas delivering those commodities which are impacted by the water challenges, getting them across the issues, getting them to understand the issues and appreciate the kind of changes and interventions that need to be made, the engagements with the suppliers and uh, not just the suppliers, but the communities in the area and, 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 and the broader collective. So whether it's water users associations in agricultural areas, neighboring farms who you're not sourcing from, but who are all drawing from the same water source, uh, municipalities and so on, that makes a significant difference. And so I think uh, for us, a practical thing is essentially getting the business to understand what the impact is and what the benefit to the business is and what the avoidance of risk that comes out of it is in, in working in that way. Anyone else? Byron, Byron, looks like you're trying to come in. Yeah, I can, I can address the, the first question about, well, the what do you do next component. I mean, for us, I mean, the first step has been communicating with our suppliers, you know, the factories that we work with. Um, and the key messages that we tell them are, well, one, you know, here's your target and, you know, kind of lay that out. Two, that it is a facility level target. So if this particular factory is making product for multiple brands, maybe they're making products for Levi's and Calvin Klein or Gap or whoever, it's a facility level target. And so if it is the most stringent target that they've received from any brand, if they hit that, therefore they'll probably be okay with the other brand commitments that they have received. Um, and then the third thing we say is that, you know, we tell the suppliers that here's your target, but you have the flexibility to hit it in the way you want. And every location is a little different. And so some locations can reach that, that level with efficiency techniques or retrofits on washing machines, for example. Um, the ones in the higher stress locations are definitely looking to water recycling and reuse. That's realistically the only way you're going to get to like a 50% reduction. And so for that, we point them to a couple of different resources. We work with uh, the IFC's program called PACT, which is Partnership for a Cleaner Textile, which uh, provides kind of on-site engineering consulting help um, to to, to, to where factories can figure out what kind of investments they need to make. Um, and we sometimes will point factories towards other competing factories in the same location and say, hey, you could probably learn a thing or two from your neighbor because they have su successfully increased their water recycling rate over 50% already. And they, they generally appreciate us making those connections. Great. Does anyone want to speak to this question about what, once you've come out of the diagnostic phase, how to filter and distinguish between unilateral action that you might take at the site level versus what's more conducive to collective action interventions and how you, what the decision calculus is on that or how, what your insights are on that particular issue? Uh, I would just say, I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Please I can come in with maybe a first response. Um, you know, I, I think it's pretty powerful when you can align, you know, I, and I'll just start off by saying, I think this is very dependent on the basin that you're working in and the type of work that needs to happen. Um, but I've found that it's been incredibly powerful when you can get a number of similar industry companies together who, I, because, you know, I, in working with my counterparts at Levi's and, and at Gap, you know, coming together pre-competitively and talking to suppliers in a clear way and, and in a kind of a, a unison way of what, of what we're trying to achieve at the end of the day in terms of targets and, and making progress at this basin is really kind of the only way to cut through a lot of 
what can be a lot of information overload and miscommunication. And so we can get everyone moving together kind of at the same um, or towards the same targets, I think it's been really helpful and powerful versus other basins where you can have a lot of other actors, a lot of other industries involved. And then I think it's a little bit harder um, and you might be just working with just your suppliers um, at the basin. Thank you. Uh, Rivash, do you have a couple of uh, remarks you'd like to add to that? It sounds like you were also going to come in. Yeah, Jason. So in our case, we have two operations, uh, two large operations, one in Sasselberg and one in Sukunda. And basically, you know, after the pilot study, we these operations went and assessed the opportunities internally to, to, to set such meaningful targets. And when they looked at beyond the fence line opportunities, it made more financial sense to try and secure our supply beyond the fence line than internally. And therefore, we believe driving something like water loss reduction with host municipalities made more sense for us. So it, it was more a, a, a financial decision to try and look beyond the fence line for opportunities than internally, as, as much as do, looking at in, in initiatives internally. Thank you. I, I would just add that um, it, in our experience applying this framework and working with the companies in, in applying the framework is that one of the things uh, built into the way that you approach the basin diagnostic is understanding from the local stakeholders what those key water challenges are. So inherently what comes out of that is an understanding of if you focus your targets around those priority water targets that are the most pronounced challenges, you have inherently gone through a process of identifying stakeholders that you may be able to partner with that actually can have impact on those issues. In fact, that process informs the types of actions that you could take and partnerships you can develop because they, those organizations are best positioned to have impact on that topic. So it's actually, it, it, it's a, you can think of it as the framework being a way to inform what your local partnership and collective action strategies may be. Um, we've reached the top of the hour. Uh, there were a lot more questions that came in through the Q&A function. I know that uh, there, we did try to address as many of those as possible in writing. If any uh, of the attendees would like to uh, engage with any of us after this event where we can try to answer those questions, we'd be happy to do so. There was a question around uh, whether or not the PowerPoint presentation could be shared with attendees. We intend to do that, uh, as I understand. And I think also there will be a recording uh, that will be shared. This uh, URL is where you can download uh, detailed reports about the key, uh, case studies that were talked about today, as well as the framework that was developed by the partner organizations. This is the publication on uh, the far left. Uh, and of course, we encourage as many companies as possible on this call to go down this journey of trying to set contextual water targets and have that framework inform the collective action work that you drive in water stress basins around the world. So um, with that, uh, any other housekeeping, uh, Tian or, or Sonali, that I should mention before we adjourn? Looks like you have Tian's uh, email address so that you can use that. Uh, uh, as well, if you want to get uh, any of your questions answered subsequent to this uh, webinar. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you to our panelists uh, for joining us today. And thank you all for taking the time out of your day to be a part of this webinar. Have a good day.